I have two topics. Um, the first one's a little lighter than the second, but I thought I'd start on um, an influencer note and kind of talk micro influencers a bit. Yeah. I think like during COVID, it's kind of been a daunting time, especially for small creators, trying to differentiate like what a good collab looks like from a bad collab. We saw this with Parade this year. They got a lot of backlash as an underwear company. They were doing a lot of trade with influ micro influencers specifically, and they got a huge movement of people against them that had done content for them because they were being gifted and seen it as exploitive after. It brought up questions around how do like creators protect themselves and make healthy boundaries with brands and how do brands create healthy boundaries with influencers so they don't have to worry about this backlash. So really why I'm asking is because I thought from your perspective as like a founder that has a platform that caters to the creator and the brand, what kind of advice do you have for small creators or micro influencers that are trying to decide if this low budget or no budget project is healthy and good to develop their brand or if it's actually exploitive and in retrospect can affect the brand poorly with these types of backlashes that brands have been facing? Ooh, uh, there's so much there. Um, and I'm actually really interested in your perspective I, I, I kind of have this private goal to never sue anyone or be in like a, a lawsuit for the entirety of, of my company's existence, just because like, I think that as a, as a verbal guy, as a communicator like you, I always think that words can fix problems. Um, mm -hmm. But we almost just got into a, a pretty big lawsuit because um, of this exact thing where we brought work to a, a 150 people, but low paying work to a hundred. And it was an opportunity mm -hmm. to get in with a big brand. I won't use the name, but like a very big brand that everyone's heard of. We, it was a pilot budget. So we, we really didn't have much money. I spent all of the money, meaning none of the money went to my company. I used it all on content to try to impress this brand to get a bigger contract. And then even spent more money than we'd been paid. So I went into my pocket to do sort of a low budget, still budget, but low budget, lower than market rate for sure thing mm -hmm. for a hundred people. So I emailed it out and I was like, yo, here's the situation. I explained it just like that. Do you want to participate for the chance to A, add a really big brand, probably the biggest you've ever worked with to your portfolio, B, help us look badass as a community to then win more business which will benefit all of us right um, and see it's just like i don't know you're sitting at home it's covid like you get to be creative and by the way make a little bit of money even if it's like below market rate um and it's a free country and most people were like thrilled and we got a lot of interest and so on but naturally some people weren't and i engaged in what i would call healthy discourse with um some about this topic is it exploitive and so on? And then uh, another company, and I use company in quotes because they're basically a two person photo studio. So like a very small, you know, very small company started chirping us on Instagram and like told this whole story about the exploitation of the creator, right? And, and pointing the finger at us and this client. And then a lot of their followers who didn't have the backstory started reposting and reposting and reposting and adding the client. Mm. So then I get hit up by the client who's one of the 10 biggest food companies in the country. Oh no. <laughs> What's going on? And I'm like, great, I'm going to lose. Like I've literally been working for five years to get the biggest client I've ever had to benefit creators and to democratize, like to bring work to 150 people. And I'm gonna lose that. All these people are gonna lose work because these girls like needed to, you know, and what I found fascinating, and there's so much here, like I said, but what I found fascinating about what they were upset about is they wanted me to hold a high watermark, like shoots are no less than $3,000, let's say, a pop. And if I chart, if I allow brands to, get content for under that I'm allowing creators to be exploited. The irony of that, of course, is that we have tens of thousands of creators on our platform. If I drew that line, like, and I could, 
we do have, by the way, a minimum, it's only like $300 or something. But if I said $3,000, we'd have 5% of the amount of flow through the hub as we do today, which means only the best, best, best creators would get work. Mm -hmm. And so ironically, it's sort of, if you think about income distribution in our country, and like a lot of liberal talking points around wanting to take the money and spread it over more people. That's exactly what I was doing with this campaign. And yet I kind of got cancel cultured, which is sort of a liberal concept be because of that democratization. And it was almost like they would have preferred me to take what little budget we had for this pilot and split it over fewer people, mm -hmm. thereby not bringing work to more people. So I found that very interesting. And, and I actually asked them if they wanted to have a discourse like this, because I think there's a lot here. Um, so I have more thoughts, but le let me get your reactions to what I just said, because then it's more fun. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely one of those things where you have to, like you were saying, kind of pick and choose because only the creator can know if that's beneficial for them. And I think when it comes to like business strategy as a freelancer, whether you're a photographer or designer or whatever, you do pick and choose your battles based off of what works for you and what suits you. And not to say that like the person struggling to pay rent and needs to make their um, makes their make their rent this month isn't is going to say no to a job like that you know what I mean and like that kind of feeds into the like spreading it out too because I just think in general there are certain people that have certain privileges based off their access to jobs and like that's what you're saying with the five percent of creators that would probably get the three thousand dollar job and when you're giving opportunities to people it's really at their it's at like their feet. They have to make the decision. And that was the thing I saw with the underwear company that got backlash was like the people complaining about the work were the people that consented to doing it. And as much as I wanted to side with them, I just saw it as like you, you contradicted yourself in what's going on. And I do obviously want to protect creators too, because I understand what it feels like. I've had jobs where, you know, I definitely didn't weigh the options properly but that's also just the learning process of creating. So like, it, that's totally fine for a team like them to say no to a job like that, but to not have the conversation with other people in the room that actually use that job and help them score another client that paid them twice as much, three times as much because they were impressed by that work doesn't really give the full picture. And I kind of do see it as a 50, 50, like you could go two ways, but the truth is some people are benefiting just as much as some people are mad. So it's like, you kind of take the yeah. path to good. This is going to get really mansplainy really fast, but like, this is sort of a new education. I've never taken an economics class, for example, neither have you, I don't think, right? But, <laughs> so here we are, two non-experts talking about it. But, you know, the way I, an economist talks about it is in an in a open market, in free markets, in capitalism, you have productivity. So you have a, a value set, you, Phoebe. Mm -hmm and it's worth something in the open market, your goods and services are worth like a certain amount of money. And the better you get at doing what you do, like content creation, the more valuable you are to the open market. And it's meant to be fair because if people discriminate in any way, gender, race, uh, age, you name it, then their competitor won't discriminate. Their competitor will hire you and use your value right so so the market is incentivized to accurately price your value if you get the opportunity to shoot for free let's say or for trade and it's making you better it's your job as the creator to increase your productivity and if you can increase your productivity it's worth more later and so it's all about like delaying gratification versus getting it right now and what I find with a lot of creators, particularly young ones or new freelancers, so they're like, I have value. I want to extract it today, which is akin to having a fruit tree with a hundred lemons or a hundred, whatever's more delicious than a lemon, hundred watermelons and picking them when they're, I guess they don't grow on trees. What grows on trees? <laughs> hundred apples. And you pick them when they're small. You're like, I, I'm, I, I'm hungry. I want an apple. And you pick it. Now you have 99 apples. You pick it, you pick it. And ideally what you do is you like let them ripen on the tree and you just wait and wait and wait and water and you're adding 
water and sunshine and other things and allowing the apples to get bigger. And you wait until they're at their biggest and ripest and then you pick them. Mm-hmm. So like, I still don't pay myself a salary at the hub. And I'm always like, is this the year? Is this the time? But I'm like, we're still growing. We're still getting to the point where that money could be used towards growth instead of being harvested. Right. And I'm playing that long game. And I think if you can afford it, play the long game, invest, like build relationships with clients, build case studies, build your book, and then your productivity, your value in the open market is larger. And every single job you get six months from now, 12 months from now, two years from now, will pay you 50% more, double, triple. So I'd say take all those jobs, if, they, if they're the kind of work you want, if they align to your brand, if they are adding value and productivity to your offering, for sure do it. And if they're not, then of course tell them to fuck off. There's, and, and this is a, a tale as old as time where you know, artists have work that pays the bills and then the work that inspires them. And like, so maybe you take the job that will pay you the day rate you think you deserve or pay you the amount. And then if there's shit that really aligns to your brand, but it's for trade, do it because it's building your book. It's building your credibility. It's building, I've worked with these clients, like, mm-hmm. right? And then exactly. you can harvest later. That's, that's my take on it. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I feel like that's a healthy perspective. And I hope people don't, you know, shoot down projects that they are killing to do, like want to do so badly when the truth is like some of these brands do only have a certain amount of money allocated to micro influencers or to influencers as a whole. And gifting is a huge part of that part of that process. And I've learned with giftings, especially in like a social media from a social media gaze where they're assuming like Pojo is going to have our product. It's incorporated in Pojo's life, right? Like I see it more as if I think something integrates into my lifestyle in a healthy way and it, it you know feeds into like what I like to do and what makes me happy subtly putting up a post where like yeah maybe I charge for a story swipe up regularly but like if my followers are going to like a product and a brand likes working with me it's better for me to do that regardless because beyond a brand there's also a team and people forget as well talking to people over email a lot of these PR teams are connected with six other brands you like and like it never hurts to be like, I love working with brands like this. If you ever have opportunities in the future, you think align with me, don't hesitate to reach out. Those things feed you to campaigns. Those things feed you to, you know, the larger opportunities that there is budget allocated. A lot of it does come from, like we've said, and we've talked about in the past, like there's one person over here making a decision that affects all these people, goes back to the democratization of it. And if you can play the game right, which I know is like, you never know on the back end what it really is it'll benefit you in the long term. I've definitely had some jobs that came from the tiny job. And then the big jobs were just right here behind the surface, just waiting for somebody to take them. For sure. Yeah. I like what you said. Something you said reminded me of this thing I'm experiencing a lot recently where I love this game where there's a really clear power dynamic. So like an example would be like an employer and an interview and an interviewee. Like, I want a job at your company. Mm -hmm. There's a very clear power dynamic where like the the employer has like all the power and you're like this little like, please hire me, please. Um, In in my world, it's venture capital and startup. Like if you're a venture capitalist, you're like, maybe we'll invest, you know, and the startup's like, any money will help, please, anyone, anyone. Or uh, in the agency world, it's like, Uh, clients have all the power and the agencies are like, please hire us, please. We need the work. We need the work. Right. Mm -hmm. And the influencer world or or creator world, it's like, please, please, please. I'll do anything. I need to make rent this month. I'm fascinated by when the power dynamics invert. So there are certain brands that I know that are super hot right now where VCs are like, please choose us to be the ones to give you money. And the brand is like, I don't know. Like I started a venture fund, a small one. And I offered a brand a hundred thousand dollars and they were like, mm, like we, we have a lot of other people, you know? And I'm like, really? Like you're going to what? Like you're turning <laughs> me down or like for you, I'm sure like your brand is so powerful you because you've invested so much into it and curated it so carefully that like you've turned brands down brands. Like 
probably beg you sometimes. And so, and the same thing in love, right? Like if you're, if you just want to be loved or hook up with other people so badly, people can sense that they can smell that if you're more selective, people come to you. So yeah, I think, I think like riding back in the saddle a little bit, building a brand, standing for something, if you can get that very tight and very powerful, people will come to your doorstep and the power dynamic shifts. Mm -hmm. But if you're just like trying to get a dollar anywhere you can, you have kind of fucked your brand as a, as an influencer. And so it's less desirable from the brand's perspective. Definitely. Like you, Pojo, like you have such a tight brand that brands want to borrow that power. And so they would kill to work with you. Mm -hmm. But if you're just like a, I'll do anything micro influencer, you have no niche, you have no power, you have no audience, you have no clout. And that's back to the productivity, like capitalism thing again. It's like, you, you haven't actually built anything of value and that's why brands aren't paying you. Exactly. And I think earlier in my social media you know, presence, career type thing. Cause nowadays, like it really is like I last year, like I was blown away by how much of my like overall income came from Instagram, like something that I didn't think I was investing enough time in and in like our day and age and like living on the internet, all you do is compare yourself to how other people are playing the game. At least if you're business strategy focused like us in some way, like, I think that's one of the daunting things, but the truth is like, you just got to keep feeding this monster in a way because Instagram in itself and social media like I saw some of the biggest contracts I'd probably see yeah last year during COVID I saw some of the biggest contracts like I've ever seen in my inbox because of just being present on social media and authentic like I think that's the other thing like forcing your hand because a brand wants to give you 200 bucks 800 bucks maybe you're the 10,000 buck person like doesn't really matter. Like we see it all the time. The moment you don't post an alignment to like what your purpose and product is or tiers like of your social media, right? Like, let's say like, if I look at my tiers, I think foods, foods, a focus, sustainability is a focus. And then kind of like my lifestyle is a focus, like New York, like young vibing, whatever. Like there's some sort of like primary thing there that brings everyone in. And if I go on and post like I don't know. A good one was like a company that was like a pillow company reached out to me. They're like, we would love to do a sponsored post on your feed. And I was like, I've never posted in my bed unless it was like a hilarious, like weird styled photo. That's like just for the grant, like just like memes. Like I've, I'm just not that person that's going to be like, wow, I just can't believe how like these microfibers are affecting my, like that, that's not my tone. And that would never align with me. So picking and choosing and if I had gone and done that I think people would have just been like yo Pojo's pushing pillows now like this is off brand and yeah, well you're you're drawing down you're like like po like something I'm fascinated by is value stores mm -hmm. like they're like uh, how do we store value so like one that everyone knows is like U.S. dollars but there are other like values like how many followers you have on Instagram mm -hmm. that's like another currency and so like let's just make up a currency like or we could call it clout or like just pojo power. Like if you have a hundred thousand pojo powers, you can like take that and trade it in. So you could have taken 10,000 pojo powers and traded it for 10,000 US dollars. You have less pojo power now because some of your followers are like, what, a pillow? Like she sold out, but you got 10,000 US dollars for it. But to your point, it's the best when you can actually get more Pojo power where your followers are like, oh fuck, she just switched me onto Ourobora. That's a super, like, I like it. It's a good mm -hmm. product. And, oh, by the way, you made some US dollars or to your point before you're not getting paid, but you get a product you really like, or you build your book or like, or your what? Oh, I said, or your, or it, like your feed's finally meshing. Like maybe you were in like a tough spot with content and you actually have something to post about that feels on brand and your followers are engaging and like, you know, not to make it all numbers, but the truth is like, it is kind of a game in that sense. If you're being true to your brand though, and you keep building it, like I, for instance, like I think sometimes when I start posting the things that I want to see and I don't see the response I want immediately, it can be discouraging. But once you kind of stay consistent with it, you see also that like, 
it, it plays a part too. Like it doesn't really matter if it was the $800 post, the $2,000 post or the $0 post, the engagement's the same. And so that kind of also shows like the right integration in it too. Like when everyone's just vibing with everything. So Pojo, let me ask you a question with the time we have left. Um, so like, let's stick with the whole value store thing, right? You have, you have 100,000 Pojos, Pojo powers, and you want more power. You want more mm -hmm. Pojo power. How do you think about, <clears throat> if I said like, so we we're measuring the strength of your brand and it's at 100,000 right now, that's the score. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get to like 150 or 200,000 in the next year? How are you as like a 21, 21 year old? 21. Mm -hmm. 21 year old creator who's like been in the game a long time talking about like channels, like you mentioned Instagram versus say TikTok or versus like Clubhouse or something or like how if you really want to, if you really want to focus on strengthening your brand and the power that you have that can be converted to dollars later or converted to whatever, what, where are you? How are you building that? The one thing that I've been really kind of compartmentalizing and thinking about is like what content lives where and how does it perform? Because I could make a cooking video on YouTube and make a I can make a cooking video every single day on YouTube and post it every single day. Let's say it's even a, like three minutes, four minutes, and I could sit and wait for an audience to find me, or I could put a cooking video on TikTok or even Instagram Reels at this point because of the way the algorithm works there too. And that could find four times, if not 10 times, if not a hundred times, if not a thousand times more people just based off the algorithm alone. So I think personally coming from a place where like I was initially posting just for pleasure, just for, Hey, I'm a model. Look at what I'm doing. This is my brand, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't as focused. And now I'm learning, like, especially in 2021, my stretch is kind of dominating TikTok and integrating my podcast too, like learning what assets I have, like creating the assets I want regardless. So if that's YouTube, go make your YouTube videos, but also make a TikTok at it. You know, like I did interviews or like for you, like, yes, like these are great bite-sized things. They can live on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. It's just about placing it the right places and learning the algorithm so you can benefit the most. Because the truth is there's an audience everywhere for us. So I've learned that this year, especially like with my plan that I'm working on right now, it's know what lives where and why and don't play yourself if you don't want like you know a younger audience like I, if i want 13 to 20 year olds i'm going to tiktok like that's where you gotta go like that's where you're gonna find like the people that eat sleep breathe it so don't play yourself there but if you want like a very like sophisticated clientele make that feed fire and make your stories like art reviews or you know integrate people and tag the people that you look up to or tag the people you're watching the the zoom meetings of or the art book you have like i think it's just like you got to know what you want out of it um so for me it's been actually establishing this is what i want and i'm gonna get it and so and then it's actually consistency from there on out which i love your point about like posting something natively like it's a video right so maybe it like goes to youtube first but then there's a TikTok edit there's a this there's a that like there was a there was a strong push earlier in the social media sort of evolution where people would say, like, build a following in one place, like force people to come to blah, your mm -hmm. Instagram, like, that's it, period. And a lot of people that I kind of follow in the space and like learn from were like, no, and they were very early on the like, no, enable people to find you anywhere and everywhere, like build the path of least resistance, like, mm -hmm. they want to find you on TikTok, let them find you on TikTok, you want to over here. And you so you want to live everywhere. And if you can have, as you say, like that asset, that one piece of content, maybe it's natively posted as a podcast, but oh, by the way, you had a camera rolling. Now you can take little snippets from the podcast and drip them out on TikTok or you can, right? So you can take the mothership, have it, you have one place where you're really trying to build that following or you feel like that's your native platform, but then you really do want to have these tentacles off to pull people into the mothership. And it's okay if they're finding you over here on TikTok or over here on your, the, the podcast or over here on YouTube, right? Exactly. Um, and, then, and then I think the key is just 
Yeah, I find it really interesting. I won't use any names, but like people we probably both mutually know that I've known since the beginning. You know, I know people that had 2,000, 5,000 followers, you know, in the day and now have, you know, that many million, like two, five, six, 10 million followers. And watching them move bodies around, watching them be like, yo, people on, like they blew up on Instagram, like, yo, I now have a TikTok. Yo, I like you, I have a podcast over here, like moving the bodies, moving mm -hmm. the value, and then squeezing sometimes. So it's also interesting watching them be like, yo, I have a new clothing line. Yo, I have a new da da da. So moving the value and then extracting the value mm -hmm. and doing it in a way that hopefully when you extract doesn't pull down too much, but actually you really win when it adds. Right. So like we've already said one name, so I'll say it again, Sam Damashek did an amazing job build, like starting a clothing line, making it very hip on brand for him. He did it like Supreme style where he'd make short, small little runs and do drops. They'd sell it like that. So he created this scarcity and this sexiness where when he monetized his brand, like, yo, buy Wish Me Luck, which is the name of his clothing line, people fuck with him more, not less. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people are like, hey, buy Diet Detox Tea. And everyone's like, fuck off. Or they're like, hey, I've started this like fitness class, da, da, da. And they're like, fuck off. Like, and then you lose value your value score goes down, not up. Mm -hmm. exactly. So I guess to summarize my point, it's like have a native spot, sure, but live everywhere and let people find you everywhere. Make sure the web is connected. And then if you're going to pull down on it and monetize it, try to do it in an integrated enough way that builds your clout, not cashes it in. Definitely. And learning that like, maybe that post that you regret you're like damn it that was off brand it's like your yeah your value went down in this realm of the people that you're focused on it might have gone up in the yoga world because you ended up doing this class maybe two or three people found you but it is learning to like it's learning to put the value where you actually want it to grow so I totally agree I think it's just about allocating the energy properly let's go cool. what are the two